Japan, anchor in the east. Here is your narrator, John Secondari. Good evening. The title of this program, Japan, anchor in the east, is the expression of a pious national hope. Until a few weeks ago, this hope seemed a reality. It was one of the more pleasant aspects of this post-war world that the Japanese, who'd been our bitterest enemies, had developed into dependable allies. Industrious, energetic, politically stable, and seemingly highly devoted to democracy. In fact, one might have thought that Japanese democracy was not an imposition of the American occupation, but something the Japanese had been looking for for thousands of years. Perhaps we cannot yet determine whether our impressions were too hopeful, but we can try to understand what may have caused Japanese by the hundreds of thousands to demonstrate against a treaty with us and a visit by our president. This program is a look at the enormous changes which have come to Japan in just the last 15 years. Changes in economy, in the system of government, in the Japanese outlook on life, changes which have produced an external prosperity, but an inward turmoil which found one of its manifestations in the writing and demonstrations which shocked all America. Now, whether Japan can absorb and understand the best in the new and still retain the worthwhile in the old, whether it can accept its position in Asia and its strong ties to the West, these are the key questions. Japan is an anchor of Western policy in the Far East, an essential foothold, a strategic military base, but most important, it is a window which displays to all of Asia what the practice of democracy and free enterprise can achieve. Japan is only miles away from communist China. Further, Japan is our most populous ally. More than 92 million people living in an area smaller than our state of California. Seldom in his life is a Japanese completely alone. Wherever he goes, he's part of a crowd. The space he stands upon, he must share with his neighbor. And early, the Japanese discovers that life in such tight quarters can only exist with mutual consideration. Politeness in Japan is more than a national characteristic. It's a national necessity. It's a lesson no Japanese ever forgets. Nor can any person in Japan ever forget the great national problem, how to live where there are so many when there is so little space and so very few natural resources. Under these conditions, existence is not only an individual problem, but a national anxiety. Even in trains, one pushes when one has to, but always apologizes for the unfortunate necessity. Even in the struggle for success, the Japanese competes as he can, but he must always be mindful of the tradition which prohibits him from stamping on another weaker than he. Perhaps because he lives so close to the subsistence level, the Japanese values cooperation so highly, is a genius at it. Today, Japan is one of the great industrial nations in the world, the greatest shipbuilder of all. Each new vessel a building on the ways means dollars for Japanese industry, and Japanese industry must pay in dollars for whatever it lacks, and that is almost everything. Japan lacks iron ore. It lacks adequate grades of coal, almost all metals and minerals, and lest we forget, the possibility of raising enough food for all its people. Japan's only wealth is more than 90 million pair of hands, all eager to work. It is these hands which have rebuilt the new Japan, for it is a new Japan. The old one disappeared in the rubble of war, one of the most devastated of all nations. The new industries were born of a cooperation between the Japanese people and the new system of life, which their defeat and then the American occupation both had placed upon them. We suggested what they needed, they accepted. We taught, they learned. And where we did not volunteer to teach, they asked for instruction. In a nation where dignity is of so high a value, there is amazingly little false pride. No item is so small or unimportant that it is ignored by the Japanese. Industry makes big cars for adults. Cottage industry makes toy cars for children. 20 girls in a loft, a conveyor belt, and out pour the toy cars for the children of the world. Japan exports toys even to Germany at one time, the greatest toy maker of them all. It used to be in pre-war Japan, in pre-war days, that the label made in Japan meant both cheap in cost and cheap in value. But this is no longer so. In their new industry, the Japanese have incorporated techniques and standards of the highest efficiency. 
Today, Japan not only competes, but competes successfully in a dozen fields which demand the greatest precision and the highest quality. It also competes at a far lower price, since the Japanese worker labors longer hours and for far less money than his Western competitor. Japanese women offer a ready market, and the Japanese woman, apparently satisfied with her own emancipation, which allows her to work, even if for almost half the salary of her brother. Between the ages of 15 and 19, almost all Japanese women work, six days a week for an average of $30 a month. After 19, it is hoped that they will marry so that their places can be taken by others. In a way, marriage too is a public responsibility. This is a new world, born out of defeat, through the convenient marriage of popular determination to live in peace and the generosity of the victim. It has resulted in the highest standard of living in all of Asia. Surely it is a success story, one made possible by the willing industry of the people and the leadership of Japan's industrialists, politically conservative, increasingly concerned with the pressing need for greater markets. Here is Taisho Ishizaka, chief spokesman for Japanese business. Mr. Shizaka, what percentage of your manufacture is exported? Oh, I think it's, uh, you know, there's uh, that's nearly 30%. 30%? Yeah. Exactly. Now, is this a good proportion for the gross industrial product of Japan uh, as a whole? Well, uh, nowadays, uh, the, our, the, the balance <coughs> of export and import is rather favorable uh, in the recent year. But in the future, we must increase uh, our uh, export is much more. Now, to what markets do you look to as your principal source of revenue? Well, nowadays, I think that the United States is the uh, biggest item now. We are increasing to the South America and other countries. But as for the Far East, uh, Southeast Asia and India and such countries, Oh, they are uh, very eager to industrialize their country, so they want uh, some generators and such things and very much. But uh, as for the payment, it's a rather difficult question now. So therefore, the type of trade that mm -hmm. the Japanese industrialist is looking for is his product paid for cash on the barrel head. <laughs> yeah, that should be the fun, yes. Well, would you be looking towards the east? Would you be looking towards China? Well, as for the communist China, so far as uh, it is not recognized by the, the free nations, I think it's very difficult to have the uh, trade uh, with communist China. But many people want to do so. I understand that there is a certain flow of Japanese goods going into China now by way of Hong Kong. I think so, yes. Is it very large? Oh, not so very large. It's not. It's very difficult, you know, to uh, to guess. <laughs> Mr. Ishizaka, I understand that you have some very good ideas about the responsibility of all nations here in the East as far as maintaining a common front. Would mm -hmm. you like to express it for me, please? Oh yes. Or uh, as uh, uh, the uh, free nations, the line of starting from Philippines, Taiwan, Okinawa, and Japan, and the Russian Islands, uh, is uh, just facing to the line to, uh, to the Communist China or even to, to the Soviet, you see. If any of this chain is uh, broken, it will not be good uh, for, not only for Japan, but even for the United States, I think it's a very serious matter. Yet, the Japanese government is spending only about 3% of its gross national product to maintain an army, a navy, and an air force. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that Japan should increase its expenditures? I think so. <laughs> Do you think that Japan should be yes. in a position to defend itself by sure, itself? Sure, sure, yes. Oh, yes. I think it, after the war, uh, the spiritually, religiously, socially, or education, or politics, economy, of course, all fell in the great confusion. But I think that our economical cycle was the first to uh, come back uh, to the stabilization. As for the politics, and especially for spiritual world, much it. 
It is the skill of 92 million pairs of hands like these that have completed the economic cycle, a stupendous growth for post-war Japan. It still must be seen what the 92 million hearts and minds of Japan will do about the spiritual and the political problems, which are still unsolved. As Mr. Shizaka said, Japanese industrial problems are all right, but not those in the rest of Japanese life. These are the products of Japanese industry. Cameras large and small, binoculars, even to the powerful miniatures, tiny radios. The Japanese have a delicate gift for making tiny things. But large or small, these are the tools of peace. It might even be accurate to say that Japan is a nation in its present image, largely created by us, because certainly without our aid, modern Japan would not be what it is. But then one must add, that modern Japan could never have achieved its present standard of success without the complete dedication of its people, all of them determined to make a living in peace. No more dreams of empire and conquest. To all Japanese, the lessons of World War II are simply stated. All war is evil because war destroys. Above all, it destroys the tool for living. Japan must have peace, peace to work. Today, Japan finds itself squeezed between the immense forces of East and West in chilling conflict. Economically, politically, ideologically, it is cut off from its immense neighbor, China. An Asian nation, its eyes are turned away from the East and towards the West. It is not for nothing that the two most popular brands of cigarettes in Japan are called hope and peace. I will be back in just 60 seconds. Just as startling and obvious as the economic revolution of Japan is the cultural. Here we have a people trying to keep a hold of the past and at the same time grasping towards the future. Now take for instance language. The Japanese language is ill-suited to our modern bureaucratic and industrial society. It is a language of elegance and indirection. It was designed for a charming, a leisurely world. Now this is a Japanese typewriter. 2,000 characters set upon a base and every character is needed to express whatever the Japanese language can make specific. It is a slow and an awkward tool. It is different from the ancient Japanese letter brush used by hand, only in that it is mechanical. It would be impossible to type modern business letters on a machine of this sort. Now, because of the difficulties with their language, the Japanese can do one of two things. They can either use English or they can try to bring English words into Japanese. And by the way, this is the latest model Japanese typewriter. Since 1945, the Japanese have adopted English as their second language, but they still think in Japanese. And the Japanese system of thought and logic is entirely different from the Western. It's not inferior, it's not superior, it's just different. And this too makes it difficult to adopt new ideas. Now, whenever the Japanese need a new word to express a new idea, they borrow it directly from English, and then they add an O, as for instance, light-O for light and sound-O for sound. Thus, they have a word they can use. But when it comes to words expressing more sophisticated concepts, such as equality or liberty, no one knows whether, besides the words, they have also adopted the same meaning we give them. It always is hard to say with the Japanese. They are such enthusiastic and gifted adapters. And it is the young people of Japan who are the most eager to adopt new words, new dress, even the new high art forms of Western culture. Tokyo's rock and roll cafes, there are thousands of them. Japanese youth goes for rock and roll in a big way, though always with dignity. The singer does not speak English. The Japanese version will have little in common with the American words, but the general effect is Western, exciting, modern. Japanese youth finds enormous excitement in everything Western. They revel in their new freedom, which allows them to go where they wish, do what they wish, read what they want, discuss and adopt new ideas. They're rebels against the old way of life. Eagerly, they adopt the externals of Western society and even some of its less popular usages. Their diet is changing. 
Japanese youth is growing taller and heavier than their parents. But nothing they can do can change the immutable fact that they're citizens of a nation so crowded that even the pinball machines have to be set up vertically. Nor that they are Asians living just off the immense mainland of Asia. This is not a cause for resentment. Japanese are realists. They accept facts. They try to adapt to them. The Japanese would like to be a bridge between the Far East and the West, the meeting point for two societies, two ways of life, two systems of thought. They would like to be internationally what they like to think that they are in their own homes. But traditional Japan, the millennial way of life, still lies immediately behind the doorstep of any Japanese house. Here, around the family hearth, it fights a battle against change. Sociologists believe that the battle is fated to be lost, that the tight unity of Japanese family life will have to give pressure and uh, give way under the pressure of their new industrial society. Already the ties between generations are loosening. It is the older people of Japan who hold to the ancient traditions. It is they who are fighting the battle of the household gods against the pressure of a new, unknown global world, either hope or monster. But the customs are still strong and they may yet prove ineradicable. Although more and more houses are being built to incorporate Western ideas for living, everyone admits that the result is a strange contrast with the simple, the almost fragile elegance of Japanese tradition. Even the Japanese who own such rooms are not comfortable in them. The old way of life, so simple as to be almost ascetic, is still their preference. Tea sipped while seated on a mat-covered floor, the spare decorations which have inspired so many Western furnishings. Even the lady of the house in act of formal deference to the man. Today, this is still the preferred way of Japan, for all the rock and roll and the jive talk on the streets outside. This is the girls' championship basketball team of Japanese industry. Japanese industry has a large program of organized activities for all its employers. And this too is part of their concept of civic responsibility, to afford as many people as possible the opportunity for a varied life. It is also the politically conservative industrialist attempt to channel the younger generation's energy and its desires for a new way of life. Japanese girls are enthusiastic about sports. But yet, every Japanese girl today is expected to know the formal cadences of the tea ceremony, how to arrange flowers, She's expected to know both before she's considered ready for marriage. These abilities are held to be essential parts of a natural dowry, skills without which she could not hope to bring a full measure of beauty, dignity, and serenity to a married life. And not only do the older people of Japan still believe this, but the young people of Japan themselves. These young ladies in ceremonial kimonos, gracefully acting out their ancient ceremonial pattern, Last night, these young ladies were probably beating time to a blaring rock and roll. for charm to the Western mind, this contrast between East and West, but it also is very bewildering. It is bewildering to the Westerners who have lived in Japan for many, many years. It is hard for the Japanese themselves to understand how two such conflicting ways of life can reside in one person. Even some of their more thoughtful observers are puzzled, as is Mr. Shintaro Fukushima, who is president of the Japan Times, one of the nation's leading newspapers. Mr. Fukushima, the thing that most impresses me about Tokyo is that instead of being an oriental city with a little bit of the west in it, it appears to be a western city with a little bit of the east in it. Am I right? I think you are, since after the war. 
You destroyed the old city. Well, how deep is the West in Tokyo? Not much. Just superficial. As uh, uh, we hasten to build up uh, the city after the war, it hasn't got much of a history yet. But how deep are the Western customs and the Western society? Uh, the externals are all there, but do the Japanese people still feel them? Uh, to a certain extent, yes. But as we have a city uh, like a uh, Western city, we have got those uh, uh, equipment underground. Uh, streets are not completely paved yet. We haven't got a good enough road system. We haven't got a house number system. So uh, there is a difference between the Western city and Japanese uh, city. Uh, however, they are Westernized, apparently. Your industrial system seems to be very Westernized. Yes, yes. Is it efficient? It is, I think so. But uh, it could be improved. Could be improved. Is this occidentalization of Japan a question of necessity or of preference, Mr. Fukushima? Necessity, I think. We did not start to uh, introduce, I mean, uh, introduce ourselves into Western civilization just by taste. We've got uh, 90 million people to feed on this small piece of land, smaller than the state of California and efficient and rationalized industry is the only way for us to maintain our living. And how efficient and rationalized are you as yet? Uh, we made quite a bit of improvement, but not quite as yet. We've got a lot of room to be improved from now on. Yet in examining your factories, they appear to me to be efficient. The products that you produce are high quality goods, or at least the ones I've seen. Yes, but uh, generally speaking, uh, life is not so well organized to uh, uh, suit our purpose, to uh, establish the course of our country into the future. Are you looking in which direction are you looking for the future? Are you looking towards the east or are you looking towards the west? East. Uh, we cannot change our place. We are doomed to be a country in the Asia. And uh, we hope to have the living standard, standard of Eastern people raised so that uh, we can maintain our living out here with su uh, sufficient market to sell our goods. When you say that you're looking towards the East, do you mean that you're looking towards Communist China? Maybe in distant future, yes, but not now. Immediately, we are hoping uh, to have the countries in Southeast Asia developed to a certain standard so that uh, they could be counted upon as our market. That requires help other than you can get from the Asians. That requires a considerable help from America, does it not? Yes. And uh, we have a belief that that might be the only method, only way that the Americans uh, could be able to counteract upon the advance of uh, communist theories. Mr. Fukushima may be right. It may be that the West has not penetrated very deeply, even in this young, rebellious generation. But one wonders about the children, the future citizens of Japan. From their earliest days, they're carefully trained in the Japanese virtues of cooperation and industry. Japanese school children take care of their own grounds, their own schoolrooms. Yet their schooling is more and more styled on the schools of the West. The song they sing, it is a safety song about fire prevention. It has Japanese words, but the melody is a Western tune.
、えー、またここで交代にしてこっち先やるといいんですが、時間があったようですから、それではおしまい。But even the very young children of Japan feel the impact of the conflict between the old customs of Japan and the westernized way of their new nation. Since they're little children, they do not feel it as much as their older brothers and sisters, the rock and rolling, hot dog eating, pinball playing university students who then nightly return to their traditional family huts. The university students who spearhead the demonstrations and the riots. But it remains to be seen whether these young school children. Themselves being pulled between East and West, shall inherit a nation reconciled to these two worlds, or whether they too will be subject to the frustration of being merely balanced between two systems of thought and life, not opposed, but so very dissimilar. We will continue in just 60 seconds. Japan, anchor in the East. Here again is your narrator, John Secondary. Japan's drama of the last month was played against the background of 15 years of spectacular economic change, intellectual and economic conflict. The young people of today's Japan are the first of their nation to be entirely free. They and only they have grown up completely in the new materialistic and industrial society of the new nation. In general, many young Japanese look upon the emperor as a useless symbol of something no longer needed. Perhaps more than any other young people in the world. They feel their position very insecure. They worry about their own personal future over which they feel they have no adequate control. They worry about their economic tomorrow and the immense struggle for worthwhile jobs. In Japan, thousands apply for one good job. They worry about war and peace. The memory of World War II, which for Japan lasted 15 years, is ineradicable. Most of them seem to think that peace for Japan can only be achieved by neutrality. And if this appears unrealistic in this modern world, then we must accept that it is not unrealistic to the young Japanese. The riots of this and last month would prove just how realistic they think their aims can be. The seeds of last month's chaos were sown over the last 15 years. During the last 15 years, tens of thousands of students have marched in protest against nuclear weapon testing, against binding alliances, always with determination. Always seemingly greater numbers. But many people seem to think these young people and their ideas were really not to be taken seriously. Not the peaceful demonstrations such as this, nor the speeches they applauded, nor even the ideas they so freely express to almost anyone, as do these three students who talk with this reporter and ABC Far East correspondent, Ray Falk, Mr. Murata, Mr. Watanabe, and Mr. Tonino. So you three gentlemen are the First, you're all three examples of the first generation of completely free Japanese university youth. What are you going to do with this freedom? I would like to uh, pursue my own ambition,、uh, which is rather pompous and great,、uh, <laughs> to be true. Will it, would you like to know how pompous it is? Well,、um, I'm rather rebellious in it that、uh, present day youth in Japan、uh, have, uh, do not have a particular aim in life, and uh, uh, this makes their life uh, uh, tend to be rather uh, 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 boring, and uh, sometimes uh, suicides may follow.、Uh, so I. I I would I might I force myself to look up higher and、uh, put my final goal in in life to the、uh, contributing to the、uh, achievement of worldwide peace on this uh, uh, and to to do that I, I would like to enter uh, in, into uh, politics in in the future and be a, uh, an international statesman and to make the、uh, contribution. Which uh, which will uh, help to realize my、uh, pompous and great ambition. And you, Mr. Watanabe, what is your great ambition? My great ambition is, on one hand, to evacuate the poverty from Japan. Well, probably not、uh, perfectly evacuated, but anyhow, lessen the poverty in Japan. 
And uh, at least all Japanese can live in a decent house, eat decent meals, and can enjoy some entertainment. Uh, as to the means of achieving this evacuation of the poverty from Japan, I'm not uh, with the same opinion of Mr. Kishi, our Prime Minister. Oh, he just talks about uh, three evils of Japan, uh, which is uh, bribery, poverty, and violence. But he doesn't do anything about it. Why is it that Japan has the highest suicide rate among the youth of Japan? I think the main reason, <coughs> pardon, main reason that uh, Japan has such a high suicide rate is that many Japanese are still too poor. Well, uh, you read in papers that uh, the father killed his wife and uh, his two small girls and uh, killed himself because he can't buy the bread or rice for tomorrow. And uh, then you read another paper that a high school student committed suicide because he couldn't get into a college. If he ca uh, can't get into a college, good college, he wants to get in. Well, naturally, he can't get a good job, as I said. Uh, and uh, to get a good job means to get into a first-rate big company. And uh, if he fails in the examination, entrance examination, well, it means he has to go to some other college or he has to go right into work. And then he gets very small salary in small enterprises. That means he's going to be again suffering from poverty and probably he might have to commit suicide again in, in the middle age with his family. Well, uh, you make, uh, you make it sound as if life in Japan was terrible. But you know, some of us who have lived here for a while think that uh, the Japanese are great fun-loving people. Well, uh, I'm afraid that you foreigners are always looking at the brighter side of Japanese life. I know that uh, there is, in Tokyo, going on a very, every kind of fun-making, but once you go into the villages, Japanese rural districts, you will find that the situation is as bad as ever. Are there many young people in Japan who feel the way you do? I believe so. Uh, just yesterday, there was a great demonstration uh, appealing to uh, our na national diet building uh, about the uh, revision of the Japan-American Security Treaty. And uh, this is a little apart from that uh, petition, but uh, those people who went there and uh, many others uh, want socialistic uh, system in Japan. Do you agree with that, Mr. Tonino? Yes, I feel the same way as he feels. I, uh, I don't know much about communism, but um, as far as I can say is that you have to achieve socialism to um, enjoy the equal standard of living. Uh, to me, it seems to me that there are still many people who have to worry about their daily food, daily bread. So when uh, socialism is our final uh, goal. From the beginning, the Mutual Security Treaty offered a popular issue to the radicals of Japan. It played on all of young Japan's fears, military bases, espionage by planes. Above all, many Japanese youth protested against a policy which for at least another 10 years would make their country the declared political and ideological opponent of their neighbor China. So since last December, the socialists have debated inside the Diet, while outside the student and labor organizations of Japan marched in protest. But many political experts again stated that it was all a formality. The socialists were not powerful enough to carry the opposition, and the students would eventually grow older and more conservative, a now-established pattern 
as even Mr. Ekisone, one of the leaders of the Democratic Socialist Party, agrees. Mr. Sony, what of the younger generation, the youth of Japan, what are their political leanings? The, the political leanings of Japanese younger generation uh, are to the left. Uh, for instance, uh, young generation, uh, of, for instance, the students in uh, universities, uh, most of them uh, are either sympathizers of the Communist Party or Socialist Party, including our party. And uh, that is a general pattern, I think. And if they become uh, more aged, they tend to become uh, progressively more conservative. In other words, it's the old story, as in Europe, that every young man at 20 is a socialist and at 40 a conservative. That's right, yes. Traditionally, in those nations where the standard of living is rising and where the economy is expanding and people are making money, the conservatives are the one who fares best and the socialists are the one who fare worst. Now, Japan is certainly an expanding nation and the standard of living is rising. What can you offer the Japanese people? Well, first of all, uh, you mentioned about Japan's uh, rising standard of living and improvement in, of economic conditions in Japan. Uh, is not quite accurate to my mind. Well, outwardly, Japan's economy is expanding and Japan has recovered very much from the defeat, uh, etc. But uh, that is a rather, uh, rather superficial view of Japan's uh, position. Uh, there are many Japanese who are, who are underfed who are un unemployed, uh, the uh, number of unemployed amount to uh, about 10 million in Japan. Mr. Sai, what is your party's position on Japan's foreign policy? Our party advocates uh, uh, non-involvement in uh, Cold War and non-alignment, uh, non-military alignment, I should say, uh, with either of the two military blocs. Then you are in favor of recognition of Red China? Certainly. Trade with Red China? Certainly, we need that. What leads you to believe that there would be any hope for better treatment for Japan from China than, say, other free nations that have tried to handle China and Russia with good intentions? Well, uh, I don't uh, have any illusion about good or bad intentions of China, I don't say that we can have uh, full confidence uh, uh, as to the, the uh, peaceful intention of China, but it is also uh, unwise to try to push China uh, towards Russia. This uneasiness about China was an important factor in the student demonstrations. The demonstrations continued generally nonviolent. It was only in early May that they began to pose a problem to public order. By then, the U-2 plane had been shot down. The Paris summit had produced nothing but a deeper chill in the Cold War. President Eisenhower had been told he could not visit Moscow. A series of events which young Japanese saw as signs of danger towards themselves. Their government, led by the unpopular, if effective, Mr. Kishi, planned to pass the security treaty so that it would be fully ratified when President Eisenhower arrived on his long planned visit. But the cold wind blowing out of Moscow after Paris seemed to indicate to most Japanese that this was neither the time to provoke communism by ratifying a treaty with its leading opponent, and perhaps not even the time to play host to the leader of that opposition, our president. When the demonstrations failed to make a political impression on the government, on May the 19th, the socialist deputies staged a riot in the Diet itself, and they tried to prevent the speaker from opening the session. Shortly before midnight, the police were called in, 300 of Japan's finest. The police, in restoring order, also evicted the socialists. 
There was some time, a question at that time whether the police had any right to be in the building, let alone manhandle the elected representatives of the people. Socialists were out of the hall, Mr. Kishi proceeded to ratify the security treaty with the United States. He had more than the required majority. The Socialists are a very small party. It was a brief moment of political success for Mr. Kishi and his conservative party, except that it seemed to violate Japanese sensibilities about the strong, too brusquely and parentally dominating the weak. This is Professor Tsurumi, who voices his protest. The reason for the, mutual secure, uh, the, the objection against the Mutual Security Pact is quite simple. That is that it may endanger us. But the, uh, that is not the issue uh, since the 19th of May. Uh, since then, the issue is that uh, uh, the democratic procedures are violated so that uh, uh, for the reason of simple democracy, we want the present premier go and uh, the present parliament dissolved. We are too fond of uh, what you have given us in 1945. But you, you have, uh, what you gave us in 1945 was so wonderful. That is uh, the, the peaceful constitution and the democratic education system and also the land reform. All these are quite wonderful things and we stick to that. Uh, a colleague of mine, uh, uh, told me that uh, at one of the mass meetings that are being held um, well, so uh, uh, so many times these days, uh, quite naturally uh, there came out of his uh, throat uh, uh, Constitution Banzai, long live the Constitution, instead of long live the Emperor. So uh, the, the con Constitution, which is uh, of such a uh, short history, has uh, come to us as uh, has become sort of uh, implanted within us that is it's a part of uh, uh, well, uh, blood and uh, uh, soul of, uh, of the Japanese people and student Watanabe a little more yeah. gaunt than the last time we saw him this treaty is one of the imperialistic policies which Japan and the uh, United States and other countries are now putting forth. This treaty will worsen the tension in the Far East area. And uh, if we turn back to uh, the internal problem, uh, after this treaty is passed, uh, Japan's policy will again become more imperialistic and militaristic. And uh, there will be more undemocratic pressure over Japan and ja uh, Japanese people. I object to most of the uh, foreign policies of any imperialistic, capitalistic nation. Uh, and American foreign policy is well, if you look, look at the Asia, uh, they are trying to uh, enlarge their armed bases, and uh, also they want to enforce their economic so-called help or aid to some Asian nations. <coughs> and Mr. Tomoji Abe, a distinguished novelist of modern this Japan. At time of international tension, I think it is dangerous both for our people and the humanity at large to commit to something like military alliance. 
I think it is the duty of our people to promote the peaceful talks among the nations of the world. And second way, the people in Japan who are doing for the rearmament are those who once did much to do the aggressive war of decade of a decade ago. And the methods they are using for that rearmament are much against the democratic spirit. I'm sorry uh, that we couldn't choose some other people than Mr. Kishi as the Prime Minister of Japan. I have no admiration for his past and uh, I don't think that he is a reborn man in this time of post-war democracy. Well, if we have uh, uh, military bases in Japan, uh, it uh, quite endangers us uh, in uh, the present atmo atomic warfare. And Another uh, objection is that uh, uh, if we uh, uh, make this uh, treaty uh, for uh, durable for 10 years, then uh, we will not be able to uh, uh, restore our peaceful relations with uh, China. And Professor Yoichi Fujimoto, a nuclear physicist. Uh. I visited China uh, two years before, and uh, um, I asked, uh, we had a lot of talk with Chinese scientists. Uh, uh, they feel um, very sorry about the uh, American attitude to the Formosa problem about, and about the, the non-recognition non uh, non recognizing, uh, not recognizing um, China as a uh, United Nations member. Uh, I know that uh, Chinese people are afraid of American military aggression on her. Uh, and uh, they think that the Japanese American News uh, Security Treaty is a uh, uh, one step further for the, the military the, the alliance against China. Uh, therefore, I think it is natural that uh, um, if security treaty is uh, uh, ratified, uh, the barrier between um, China and Japan will become higher. Professor Turumi resigned from his professorship in protest against the government. The liberal tradition in Japan is so thin that uh, the Japanese college students uh, do not realize that uh, uh, a movement that is uh, critical of uh, the government actions can be formed on non-Marxian principles. But why did you resign, Professor? Well, that again is related to the earlier question, and I think that is uh, rooted in self-hatred, so to speak. The other professor who resigned also a few days before me also is a non-Marxian. That is, uh, the Japanese liberals in the last war that continued for 15 years uh, uh, were very weak need indeed, and that was a source of great disappointment to us. And we just wanted to show that uh, there can be a strong resistance against uh, the government actions uh, on non-Marxian principles. Well, uh, the only people who can really attack this uh, security pact and the uh, government and others who are uh, for this uh, pact are the laborers. But uh, at present, to my regret, uh, Japanese labor movement is rather weak. And uh, social, which is uh, biggest 
organization of labor in Japan is going rather uh, weak and uh, so-called neutral, which means right. And uh, someone has to uh, stir up uh, the, uh, the real, uh, real uh, class recognition among the laborers and uh, let them know the significance of this pact and, uh, and then and only then uh, the laborers will really stand up against it and uh, destroy this pact. And uh, until we can destroy this pact, I think this uh, demonstration will become larger and larger and more, more and more violent. The rest is in the headlines. The pact is signed, the pact is ratified. Some demonstrations are still continuing. If the Japanese opposition lost the political battle for the security treaty, they did prevent President Eisenhower's visit. But one wonders about the younger brothers and sisters of these students in I rioting, the brothers and sisters who are still too young for anything beyond the childish marching off to class. One wonders whether they too will grow from this to the snake dance of protest. Any program about Japan today must leave almost as many questions as it has answered. But it is a fact that the Japanese are growingly concerned about their estrangement from China and the possibility of war. That most Japanese seem to think that neutrality is their only logical course. That for all its vast economic growth, Japanese worry about having to provide one million new jobs each year for their growing population. And the students in particular worry because these jobs should be adequate to their new education. At times, people shout out of sheer frustration. Perhaps that's what a Japanese politician meant last week when he said, how can you Americans understand us when we do not understand ourselves? This is John Secondary. Good evening. Editorial assistance, Graham Grove. Japan, anchor in the east, has been a special presentation of ABC News.